Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be taking our 1D spring element and turning it into a 2D spring element, which can also be used for trusses. So our spring is going to be arbitrarily oriented, just meaning that we don't know ahead of time what the angle will be. And as before, we're going to have some forces being applied to this spring. Now, the most important thing here is to be able to talk about how this spring is oriented. So in order to do that, we need to establish some reference frames. Our X and Y reference frame are gonna be exactly what we expect with X pointed to the right and Y pointed directly up. But it's also very convenient to talk about a reference frame that is specific to this spring. So that reference frame will have an X axis parallel to the spring and a Y axis perpendicular to the spring. Now we need to name this something. It doesn't matter too much what we call it, but I like the Greek letters Xi and eta. So back to our forces here, this is gonna be the force in the Xi direction for node one, and this is the force in the Xi direction for node two. Now this looks exactly like our 1D in the Xi eta reference frame. And so we can use our old stiffness matrix to describe it. And that'll just be our k, negative k, negative k, k. And these are acting on the displacements in the xi direction. So I'm going to call this delta xi 1 and delta xi 2. This is a good start, but we really need to be able to talk about this in the x and y reference frame. The reason for that being, it's very difficult to have multiple springs, which probably have multiple local reference frames, it's hard to describe how all those forces interact. So what we can do is we can talk about how these displacements are related. So remember that U refers to the displacement in the X direction. Well, U is going to be our delta C multiplied by cosine of theta, where theta is simply this rotation angle between the two reference frames. To talk about displacement in the y direction, we use v, and that's gonna be our delta xi multiplied by a sine of theta. Now before, that was all we would have to think about, but in two dimensions, it's possible for a spring to be rotated a little bit. It's possible for some other forces to be pulling it up in such a way that we do have some delta eta as well. So to account for that, we just add in the contributions of some delta eta. For u, a positive displacement in eta results in a negative displacement in x. And so we get negative eta sine theta. And in the v direction, this is going to be a positive delta eta times cosine of theta. So now we're going to take these and we're going to go ahead and write these in a matrix form. Doing so, we end up with uv is equal to, and I'm going to use some shorthand here, instead of cosine theta, which takes a lot to write, I'm going to write c, and then for sine theta, I'm going to write s. So we get c negative s, s, c. That's going to be multiplied by our c and eta displacements. So this is going to be a key piece of the puzzle in the future. But let's go ahead and try to get our starting point in such a way that we can actually see where this might be useful. Because right now, we only have these delta Xs, and we're not talking about the delta eta at all. In order to talk about delta etas, we need to expand this to incorporate both Xi and eta. Now, to expand the forces, we need to think about some hypothetical forces in the eta direction. For a spring, these forces are going to be zero. This spring can't exert any force in the eta direction. So that being said, our force vector now becomes fc1, f801, fc2, and f eta2. We're going to have a 4 by 4 matrix here, and this is going to be multiplied by our displacements. And our displacements are delta c1, then we're going to have a delta eta1, delta xi 2 and delta eta 2. We can technically order these in any way that we want, and it's perfectly fine. 
but it helps to keep the nodes together just to kind of make sense of everything that's happening. With these as our force and displacement vectors, we need to make sure that the equations that we have are the same between our 1D and 2D formulations. So the equation that we've written here is that k times delta c1 minus k times delta c2 is going to be equal to f c1. So we look at our f c1, the top row is going to relate to that equation. And so we end up with k multiplied by delta c1, nothing times delta eta, a negative k times delta c2, and nothing times delta eta. This equation is going to need to say that the force in the eta direction is equal to zero. So the entire row needs to be composed of zeros. For the third row, we're using the second equation. So we'll get a negative k, zero, k, zero. And then the bottom row is again saying that the force in eta is equal to zero. This is the fully 2D system of equations for our local element. What we're trying to do next is take this local system of equations and turn it into equations in X and Y, which means that we want forces in the X and Y direction and displacements U and V. So we have the start of how we can actually get to U and V, but we actually want the opposite. We want delta C and delta eta in terms of U and V so that we can substitute these guys in. The way we do that is just by taking the inverse of this matrix and pre-multiplying both sides. Fancy way of saying that we divide through by our matrix here. If we do that, we end up with our delta C and delta eta equal to the inverse of this matrix. This is a special matrix, and so we just know right away that the inverse of this matrix is the transpose of that matrix. You can do the math on this, but we're just going to hold it to be true. This pre-multiplies uv, and so we can go ahead and write our uv displacement vector there. We can substitute in this matrix and vector for each of these pieces. Now, it's not quite clear how to do that yet, but we'll get there in a second. First, let's do the same thing for our forces. And if we have a force in C and a force in eta, you can see that's going to follow the exact same strategy as the displacements in order to get those into fx and fy. Our end result following the same steps is that f of c and f of eta are going to be equal to the same matrix cosine, sine, negative sine, cosine, multiplied by the forces in x and in y. Now, these are only pieces. We need to be able to do this for both node one and node two, all in the same matrix. So what we're going to do next is go ahead and take both elements together, and we can say that delta C, delta eta for node one, and delta C and delta eta for node two are gonna be equal to some four by four matrix, which is multiplied by our u and v for node one and our u and v for node two. Now, with this matrix, it helps a lot to subdivide it into four smaller matrices, just to kind of think how all these things get multiplied together. If we look at just this upper left-hand matrix here, it describes how our u1 and v1 impact our delta c1 and delta eta1. So, this upper left-hand matrix is going to be exactly the matrix that we already defined. So we'll just plug in this C, S, negative S, C. The upper right-hand matrix is describing how our displacements of node 2 affect our displacements of node 1. Well, there's no relationship there. And so we can just get rid of that piece of the matrix exactly. The same thing is true for the lower left-hand side. So all of those elements are going to be zero as well. And then finally, for the lower right-hand side, we're talking about how the displacements U and V for two affect delta C, delta eta for two. And that is going to be this matrix exactly again. And I'm using these large zeros 
to just indicate that every element in those submatrices are equal to zero. So this entire matrix, we're going to give a name. So we're just going to call this matrix C, which stands for the cosine matrix. We want to use this C matrix to transform our equation from before into the X and Y coordinate system. First, let's go ahead and write this in shorthand. So we're going to say that our forces in the local coordinate system are going to be equal to our stiffness matrix, which is defined in the local coordinate system, multiplied by our vector of displacements in the C eta coordinate system. What we're going to do is we are going to transform our C and eta's into this C multiplied by U's and V's. So this C and eta becomes a C matrix multiplied by our U vector. We're still going to have our KL matrix here, and we want to transform our local forces into forces in the global coordinate system. We also want to transform our force vector, which is now in the local coordinate system, to the global coordinate system. In order to do that, we can use this same sort of equation here, though this is going to be a local forces, and these will be our global forces. The local forces are just going to be our C vector multiplied by the forces described in the global coordinate system. We can pre-multiply both sides by the inverse of C. And so we'll end up with the forces described in the global coordinate system going to be equal to a C inverse multiplied by our local stiffness matrix multiplied by C. And all of that is going to be multiplied by our displacement vector in the global coordinate system. And these three matrices multiplied together give us our stiffness matrix in the global coordinate system. Actually computing these is a little bit tedious, but it can be done. Just remember that this C to the negative one is just the transpose. So you just switch the negative signs for the negative S and S. But the end result is going to be equal to, and we're going to take a K, just the stiffness of the spring out, and then that's multiplied by a four by four matrix, which we will once again split into four submatrices. So the top left and bottom right submatrices are the same. We get cosine theta times cosine theta, cosine theta times sine theta, cosine theta times sine theta, and sine theta times sine theta. That's repeated for both the top left and bottom right. And then for the other two submatrices, you just get all those, but multiplied by a negative one. And this global stiffness matrix is our end result for our spring element in 2D. So this was for springs. We have this K value for the spring. If we want to do trusses, which usually use bar elements, well, all we need to do is substitute this K with AE over L. Now, A is the cross-sectional area, E is the Young's modulus, and L is just the length of the bar. Everything else stays the same. All we have to do is get some material properties and plug that in in order to calculate our K value. So the next step is to go ahead and use the stiffness matrix to analyze some trusses or spring systems. So we'll go ahead and do that in the next video. Once again, I hope you found this informative, and I will catch you next time.